Thank you. I generally, my voice carries, but I guess I'm not used to speaking with the microphone, but I will today. Thank you very much. It's nice to be back at Nasser. It's like my second home. When time came to donating my library, there were four or five institutions that were actively seeking in New York and other places the collection, but for me it was very simple. Nasser would have the first choice. Uh, mainly because for all of you here, just what Mark mentioned, in the next two, three weeks, the amount of scholarly activities you have at Nasser surpasses what we have in some universities. The speakers, the enthusiasm, the help you give to students, the help you give to scholars like myself and others, to Society for Armenian Studies, the Armenian Chairs, is just fantastic. So there was no doubt in my mind that it has to be Nasser. And with the help of Nancy, Bob, Mark, Rafi, who came all the way with the car with Bob, we lugged those 275 boxes into the car. I don't know how you people did it, because I was in pain how you people did it. And especially Rafi, he was putting it all on top of that truck and drove it twice here. But it was, I hope, worth it. And God willing, when it's cataloged, hopefully more people will use it. Uh, my other regret is that I, uh, the only regret is that although we had planned for me to be with you on the trip to Kilikia, and I had started the planning of it, uh, things came up with my son and with another trip that I had already booked the trip to Greece with my students, which conflicted. So I recommended uh, at first to Dr. Payashlian, but he was busy. But I'm very happy to already have learned that Dr. Hovanesian and his wife are going to be with you on that trip, and you're going to have a ball. I envy you. I wish I was there with you. But God willing, uh, in uh, the year 2010, I'm planning a trip to India, maybe especially the Armenian communities there, which was um, one of the greatest communities we've had. Not anymore, but the churches are there. So maybe, God willing, we'll see. Now, today's lecture. The author of Jamber, Katolikos Simeon of Yerevan, the Katolikos Supreme Patriarch of the Armenian Church at Ejriadzin, from 1763 to 1780. He not only reorganized the administration of the Holy See of Echmiadzin, restored its spiritual authority, increased its wealth, and especially its political influence. In 1771, Simeon established a printing press at Echmiadzin, the first printing press in Armenia, historic Armenia. He also built a paper mill. I have copies of the paper here, the picture of the watermark, and for the first time organized the archives of the Holy See of Echmiadzin. In addition to that, he also wrote a number of religious historical works, devised the church calendar, which we still use today. Jamber, however, occupies the most important place among his writings. After assuming the title of Katovegos, Simeon gathered all the documents and manuscripts that had been left rotting in various dusty corners of the Holy See. And after examining them, wrote Jamber. Now Jamber, the term itself, comes from the French chambre, or chamber, which is Simeon's term for archival chamber, or repository. What was his objective? His objective was saving and cataloging all those documents to prove the ownership or tax-exempt status of the various properties belonging to Echmiadzin. He used these documents repeatedly against Muslim Khans or other litigants who tried to usurp the church properties or to tax them. Although half a century later, the Holy See fell under Russian rule and was spared such harassment, 
Simeon's efforts created the valuable archives of the Catholic Osage, currently housed at the Matanadaran archives, which I'm sure you've seen, Lucy, which have been, some of them, have been translated and printed by Dr. late Dr. Papazian, my teacher in Yerevan, and Professor Kostikian of Matanadaran in five volumes, which we have upstairs in the library. These documents shed light on the political, religious, and socio-economic history of the region of Yerevan and the Holy See of Echmiadzin from the 15th to the early 19th centuries. Jamber begins chapter 1 with the history and apostolic origins of the Armenian Church and the construction of Echmiadzin. It describes the several moves of the Holy See from its original site in Echmiadzin to other locations due to invasions and other uncertainties and its final return from Cilicia or Kilikia to Echmiadzin in 1441. Almost a thousand years later, they returned back to its original site. Simeon then details the lives of the Katovigoi from Mofses of Tatevatsi, 1629-32, up to his own day. After that, citing numerous deeds for land and other immovable property, he discusses the jurisdiction of Echmiadzin and lists the complete number of mills, threshing mills, oil presses, wine presses, vineyards, houses, arable fields, pastures, streams, irrigation canals, and other properties belonging to Echmiadzin from which the Holy See received an income in form of taxes. He follows this with a summary of the contents of every royal and other official ferman, the decrees, from the Persian shahs, Ottoman sultans, governors, and Muslim administrative officials. The last chapter lists the Armenian monasteries in the Yerevan region with their jurisdiction and each one with a complete list of their properties. Before discussing the great work, a short history of the Armenian church, I know you know most of it, but just to go over certain things that might not be clear. We all know that Christianity became the official state religion of Armenia in the early part of the 4th century. A number of churches were immediately built atop destroyed pagan temples. The most important of this was, of course, Echmiadzin, the mother cathedral of Armenia, which was built atop the pagan temple of Anahita. Armenian tradition also maintains that Armenians spread the new religion to Georgia, and to Caucasian Albania. Although, don't tell that to the Georgians, they get very angry. Armenians, together with the Coptic, Ethiopian, and Syrian churches, rejected the Diophysite doctrine, or as Simon calls it, the Chalcedonian heresy of the Council of Chalcedon in 451, and embarked on creating their own national churches. It's very important to remember, I know you're all Armenians and you know this, but one more time I reiterate, our church is a national church. It's church for the Armenians only. It's not like the Catholic church which has Spaniards, Frenchmen, and everybody else in it, or whoever can become member. It's a national church. The creation of, and the same with the Ethiopian church and the Coptic church, the creation of a unique and separate alphabet in the early 5th century, at the instigation of the church, cemented the central role of the church in Armenian life. The church not only acted as the spiritual leader, but during the long periods, and that's for most of Armenian history, when Armenia lacked political leadership, the church acted as the secular leader of the nation as well. And we'll go in detail about this. In 484, the Holy See left Armenia and transferred to various administrative places. One of them is the city of Ani, which we visited together, and you saw the main cathedral there and all that. For the most part, it followed the political leadership of the time. Despite these moves, 
the Holy See remained within the boundaries of historic Armenia until the 12th century, when it was moved to Skilikia, Cilicia, a new Armenian political center, which emerged after the demise of the Armenian kingdoms in historic Armenia. The fall of this last Armenian kingdom in Cilicia, in the second half of the 14th century, left the Armenian people without political leadership. Therefore, Armenian bishops in historic Armenia, who did not trust the Cilician church hierarchy, especially after Gatovikos Constantine VI of Cilicia sent Armenian bishops to Italy in 1439, where at the Council of Florence, they, Armenians, together with the Greeks and Copts, agreed to a union with the Catholic Church. We have the document. We have the Armenian document in the Council of Florence. It's upstairs. I have it in my, uh, now, your library. Upstairs, it's part of my collection. The Eastern Churches immediately rejected the idea of a union with the Catholic Church by an overwhelming majority. The Armenian church leaders then gathered in Vagar Shapat, present-day city of Echmiadzin, and decided to move the Holy See back to Echmiadzin, where the political conditions were favorable at the time, and where it could be safe from the influences of the Greeks and Catholics, the Greek and Catholic Church. Therefore, in 1441, the Holy See, together with the relic of the right arm of St. Gregory the Illuminator, because without the right arm of St. Gregory that you use for the Meron, uh, there are mean, no Armenian church has the supremacy. The, one of the reasons today Echmiadzin claims supremacy over all the other Armenian centers is because of the right arm, the relic of the right arm of St. Gregory. Despite the re-establishment of the Holy See at Echmiadzin, the rivalry between the Sunni Turks and the Shi'i Persians, as well as rivalry which had developed among a number of Armenian church leaders during this long thousand years absent from Echmiadzin, resulted in the emergence of six different religious hierarchies within the Armenian church in the period under discussion. First, the Katholic Osseit of all Armenians, the Mother See of Echmiadzin. Second, the Katholic Osseit of Ahvank in Ganzasar, what is today Karabakh. The Katholic Osseit of Akhtamar in Lake Van. And of course, the Katholic Osseit of Kilikia, which remained, although the center had moved, certain groups remained, and eventually that was established as a minor Katholic Osseit. It became only major much later plus the two patriarchates, Constantinople and Jerusalem. Echmiadzin began its new life under Katolikos Grigor X, 1443-1465. Grigor, even prior to the return of the Holy See to Echmiadzin, was viewed as the religious leader of the local Armenians by the Muslim Turkmen who ruled in the Yerevan region. In 1431, ten years before the transfer from Kilikia to Echmiadzin, Grigor was responsible for obtaining and donating the eight major villages that were to form the basis of Echmiadzin's land holdings. And that document is translated here in the appendix into English, the original 1431 document. And it's an amazing document because for the first time, the Muslim religious Sharia court agreed that the Armenian church is allowed to have a waqf, the Arabic term waqf, or donated property, tax-exempt property, which was only for Muslim mosques and Muslim religious institutions. The Muslim religious court accepted that Armenians can have that same rights as well, therefore tax free, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. By the 16th century, all the Armenian communities in historic Armenia and in the Middle East had become subject either to the Ottoman or to the Persian empires. The absence of an Armenian state as well as the general Ottoman and Persian practice 
of grouping their non-Muslim subjects into separate communities administered by their religious leaders, since there were no political leaders, left the Armenian church as the main representative of its people. The Muslim rulers soon began to address the Armenian Catholicos as the Khalifa, the Caliph, a Muslim term, the Caliph, the Pope of the Armenians. In all the documents that are in this book, it constantly refers to Armenian Catholicos as the Khalifa, the Caliph of the Armenians, with the same respect granted to the Muslim Khalifa, the representative of religion. Basically, since the Muslim Khalifa represented Muhammad, the Armenian Khalifa represented Christ in those governments. And that's very, very important when it comes to the court cases. As I mentioned, this fact, as well as the ruling of the religious Muslim courts, allowing the Armenian church to hold tax-exempt religious endowments in the form of vineyards, arable fields, pastures, houses, bathhouses, shops, caravansarais, mills, and all sorts of other immovable property, gradually gave Echmiadzin and its leadership considerable political and economic power. The wars between the Ottomans and the Persians, however, as well as the greed of local Muslim Khans, because the kings were far away. The Persian king was in Isfahan, the Ottoman Sultan was in Constantinople, Echmiadzin in the Yerevan area, this is before faxes, before telephones, <laughs> far away. The local Khans could do a lot of things. By the time the king found out, it might have been too late. On top of that, the ambition of Armenian bishops generally created a problem in Echmiadzin that by 1600, Echmiadzin accumulated great debts, owing money to Muslim Khans, to the government. This gave rise to the emergence of one or more co-Catholicoi, or deputies, or coadjutor Catholicoi. The there were a time as many as four Katolikoi in Echmiadzin, not other places, who acted simultaneously. One was the senior, then he was too old, he got another Katolikoi, then there was another one appointed. At the same time, they were known as co-Katolikoi or coadjutors. Some of these coadjutors later became Katolikoi. Some were anti-Katolikoi. Others became usurpers. And, or received recognition from the Khans and the kings through bribery and other means. We have records of people bribing the Persian Khans to get the certificate of being a Catholicos, a local bishop. Arakel of Tabriz, in the two volumes I have there, details the shameful behavior of a number of these co catholicoi especially Melik sect and Sahak. Simeon is more generous because he is a Catholicos himself, he states that the Catholicos after Grigor, until Moses of Sunni, could not accomplish anything worth noting because of the very difficult conditions of the time. Echmiadzin's real Renaissance began in 1610 with Moses of Sunni, who was one of the founders of the Sunnic Hermitage not far from the Tatev Monastery today in Armenia in Zangezur. It was in this hermitage that Vartapets, bishops, kahanas, Armenian merchants from New Julfa, Armenian secular notables who were unhappy with the conditions at Echmiadzin, with all these four Katolikoi at the same time, gathered and decided to act against the corrupt clergy and against Catholic missionaries who, taking advantage of all this chaos, had crept into Nachchevan creating large Armenian Catholic communities in Nachchewan. Later, they're all decimated, well, thanks to Simeon and a few others. They resolved to elect the capable Catholicos and to end the practice of coadjutors, to expand the political, religious, and economic power of Echmiadzin, to open schools near the hermitages and monasteries. And they began to spread this message among the Armenians 
especially the Armenians of New Julfa and Isfahan, the powerful Armenian merchant communities that I'm sure you've heard many lectures about before. By 1627, Shah Abbas was urged by the Armenian millionaires of New Julfa to issue a decree that appointed Mofses as the sole caretaker of Echmiadzin, and two years later, Mofses was elected as the Katovikos and began the complete reorganization of the Holy See. The era of the Co-Katovikoi was over. You think we have problems today with two Katovikoi? Huh? <laughs> Read the chaos that's happening. We're lucky. Mofses was followed by his pupil Philippos and then by Hakop of Julfa or Juba. Thus, until 1680, the group from Sunni and their students reigned in Echmiadzin and were able to fulfill all the goals and all the plans. Both Arakel and uh, Arakel Der and Simeon mentioned the many benevolent deeds of these three Katovikoi. Jamber lists the numerous landed property purchased or acquired by these three guys and donated to the church as tax-free endowments. Simeon views Echmiadzin as the only legitimate religious center for the Armenian people. I quote, according to established law and custom, all Armenians, wherever they live, as the spiritual church, uh, children of the faith, born through the grace of God and loyal to St. Gregory, our illuminator and his successors, have to be under the authority of the Holy See of Echmiadzin. For wherever there are Armenian churches and clergy, monks or laymen, whatever they may be called, all without exception are subordinate to the rule of the Holy See of Echmiadzin and the Catholicos of that see. Simeon has very few kind words regarding the other five Armenian centers. He dismisses the patriarchs of Jerusalem and Constantinople by stating that the first was neither a patriarch nor a prelate, since he did not have his own see, church, or parish. In addition, Jerusalem was not Armenian land, but simply a place where Armenians lived, a place of pilgrimage for all Christians where each group guarded a small section and received pilgrims. The second patriarchate, Constantinople, was also neither Armenian land nor an Armenian city, but Greek and the seat of the Greek patriarch. When the Ottomans took over the city and the number of Armenian immigrants increased there, the haughty prelates, originally appointed by Echmiadzin, took the title of patriarch with the help of local Armenian millionaires and by giving gifts to the Sultan. Now this is not me talking, it's Simeon. So I hope you don't get upset because I'm saying something against Patriarchate of Constantinople. It's Simeon's view. The Armenian common folk in Istanbul, through ignorance, have begun calling them by that name, the name of Patriarch. They're really not Patriarchs, according to Simeon. Simeon also views the founding of the Katholikosate of Akhtamar in the 12th century as an act of rebellion during the move of the Holy See to Kilikia. In his opinion, the moment the Holy See returned to Echmiadzin, the Katholikosate of Akhtamar should have dissolved itself. It had only remained in existence due to the greed and pride of the prelates. He adds, that the Katovikoi of Akhtamar were total strangers to the Armenian people. They were not recognized by them and were rejected. I quote, all the whores and dishonorable men found a wide opening with no boundaries and did anything they wanted without shame or fear from anyone. Well, the Katovikoi said of Akhtamar, as you know, uh, was terminated in 1895 after the massacres uh, by Abdul Hamid. As far as the Katolikos of Sis was concerned, Simeon points out that Katolikos Philippos of Echmiadzin, during his pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and in the presence of the Patriarch of Jerusalem, the Katolikos of Sis, and numerous high-ranking churchmen, required adherence to a number of regulations, among which were the supremacy of Echmiadzin over Sis, and it was accepted. These regulations, and we have that document, 
these regulations also forbade the Catholic state of Sis from interfering in the religious affairs of dioceses outside of its jurisdiction, which was the small jurisdiction in the area of Aleppo, basically Antilikia, the very small, at that time even sm much smaller than it is today. Simeon complains that the Sis hierarchy ignored these rules and criticizes them for consecrating for a few pounds of coffee or a donkey bishops who were not even worthy of the rank of deacon. He adds that he also ordained vartapets who were not even 20 years of age. Of course, you have to take all this with a grain of salt. He's obviously got Goikos of Echmiadzin. He doesn't accept anybody else. Simeon devotes a very long chapter to the Catholic state of Caucasian Albania in Ganza Sargaraba and the efforts of Echmiadzin to take hold of their independent acts of the Katolikoi of Ganzasar. The main problem occurred when Katolikos Yesai of Ganzasar, in 1702, taking advantage of the temporary vacancy at Echmiadzin, convinced the Russian rulers to acknowledge him as the spiritual leader of Armenians of Russia. He had the prelate of Echmiadzin, who was in Russia, <laughs> collecting dues for Echmiadzin, arrested as a spy, as a Persian spy. The Echmiadzin prelate was jailed, and he died in jail. A Yesai then appointed his own prelate from Ganzasar, and for the next 60 years, Ganzasar collected the dues rightly belonging to Echmiadzin. So it's obvious that the first and main reason for most of these disagreements between the Armenian churches and patriarchates and all that was monetary. The new Iraqs or Navi Iraqs, the nuncios of Echmiadzin, collected money in cash or kind every three years from all the dioceses under Echmiadzin jurisdiction in Persia, Ottoman Empire, Georgia, and Russia. The patriarchs of Constantinople and Jerusalem and the Katoviko in Ganzasar and Akhtamar would sometimes challenge Echmiadzin's right to collect the dues in order to keep the money for their own coffers. Echmiadzin would act immediately by petitioning the sultans, shahs, or local governors. This is not new. This happened a few years ago when the prelate in Russia for a short time, Armenian prelate, tried to keep the money collected from the Armenians in Russia in his group, and Echmiadzin protested to Moscow, and the money was sent to Echmiadzin. This is very recent. It's in our lifetime. The second reason was the 50-year power struggle between the powerful Armenian communities of New Julfa and Istanbul. The location of Echmiadzin, which was in Persia, and the emergence of the great Armenian merchant millionaires in New Julfa in the 17th century enabled the Persian Armenians to have a significant voice in the election of the Katolikos at Echmiadzin. The election of Jacob of Julfa especially, the designated successor of Philippos, without the participation of the Armenians from Constantinople, created a schism in 1664. Yeviazar, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, declared himself Katolikos. Yeviazar claimed jurisdiction over the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire and received the Ferman, a royal decree, from the Turkish Sultan. The Ferman also forbade Echmiadzin's nuncios to enter Ottoman territory to collect money. Katolikos Hagop immediately traveled to Constantinople petitioned the Sultan, spent a great deal of money bribing Turkish officials, and managed to receive permission for his nuncio to travel back to the Ottoman Empire and collect money. It all comes to money. Yevyazar continued as an anti katolikos and resided in Jerusalem. In order to end this schism, the clergy at Echmiadzin finally invited Yevyazar to become katolikos after Hakob died in 1680. Yevyazar came to the Holy See in 1682 and became the Katholikos. So that 
argument finally was resolved this way. Following his death, to please the Ottoman Armenians, his designated, Yevyazar's designated candidate, Nahapet, became Catholicos. It was only after the fall of the Safavids, the Persian dynasty collapsed, Persia was in chaos, when the Ottomans managed for the next 30 years to put their own Katolikoi from Turkey, Turkish Armenian Katolikoi. One of them is uh, Abraham of Crete, which I have his first book there, and so forth. That era also came to an end when Yerevani Armenians began to elect their own Katolikoi. There were only three. Katolikos, uh, where is it? Hakob of Shamachi, Simeon of Yerevan, and the last one, Khazar. And after that, the whole thing was over because the Russians took over the region. And once the Russians took over a region, Russian candidates that means Armenian uh, bishops who lived in Armenia, but already under Russia. From then on, it's the Russian czar who manipulates who becomes the Armenian Catholicos in Echmiadzin. Mean, that's in my other books that I've discussed in detail. Simeon believes that the Catholicos is not only the le leader of the Armenian nation, but he's responsible for the fate of his people. Just as Christ was the sole mediator between God and man, so was Gregory the Illuminator and his successors, the Catholicoses, are the mediators between Christ and the Armenian people. This is without question extremely conservative view, but Simeon was a conservative and a very cautious Catholicos. Jumber is not only silent, about the activities of Israel Ori. You've heard of Israel Ori, the Armenian hero who was went to Europe to get a European army, sent letters to Peter the Great. I have all the letters there translated in one of the books to liberate Armenia from Muslim rule. Doesn't talk about him at all, like he didn't exist. He also ignores Joseph Emin, another Armenian person from India who had come there and was trying to push the church leaders to create a liberation movement in Armenia. He, in fact, went against Joseph Emin. I have a letter there that he writes to the Georgian king saying, ignore Joseph Emin and kick him out of your court when Emin was trying to do something. In fact, Simeon ordered the burning of every copy of the famous new booklet that is called Exhortation. It's a booklet printed in Madras which advocates a new Armenian nation, a new Armenian constitution, and all sorts of other things, which again I have it in another book, which was written and published by Mofses Bagramian and Hakob Shahamirian, and which ad advocated armed struggle against the Muslims. Simeon's death in 1780 ended this period, and after that, we come to the period of Russia, which has nothing to do with this book, and it's in another material. Now, let's see what's available in this book that's important for historians, beside the church matters. Jambra is a source for land tenure in the region of Yerevan. According to Jambra, the most popular forms of land tenure in Eastern Armenia were waqf and mulk. Waqf refers to a tax-exempt charitable trust for religious purposes. And as I already mentioned, it's very interesting to note that in 1305, the Muslim court of the Mongol rulers even, approved the right of the Armenian church to receive or to purchase immovable property in form of religious endowment. Waqf was muaf, in Arabic, tax exempt from all taxes, dues, services to the central or local government. From then on, until the conquest of Armenia by Russia, Eastern Armenia by Russia, the Armenian church slowly amassed a large number of certificates of 
endowment which he has put each one of them, the original documents, and was protected by the same laws as those regulating Islamic charitable institutions. Armenian merchants, minor Armenian princes, as well as Armenian church hierarchy, who had lost their lands during the Turkish and Mongol invasions, now began to take advantage of the changes which occurred during the less turbulent times. They purchased immovable property through the Muslim courts or recorded their ancestral lands as private property. Thus, all arable land, vineyards, orchards, canals, mills, bathhouses, houses, shops, caravansarai, owned either by individuals or by the Armenian church, was considered private property. Some were tax exempt if they belonged to the church, some were not if they belonged to private individuals. These types of immovable properties could be bought, sold, inherited, transferred, or rented. We have every document about most of these properties. The owners were called landlords, and they collected one-tenth of the produce from such properties. The lands and religious endowments of the Holy See of Echmiadzin, as well as the various monasteries around Yerevan, which he mentions every monastery in the Yerevan region, were acquired through purchase, donation, annexation of abandoned land, royal land grants, or failure to repay a loan. In fact, we have documents that when Armenian peasants borrowed money from the church to pay their taxes or to dig canal, and had to sign an agreement to repay the money in three or four or five years, and they couldn't pay it, those lands were confiscated by the church. The church took ownership of the land. Another method of acquiring land was through land grants given by kings to major Armenian meliks and famous Armenian churchmen from whom they expected future services. Cases in point are the land grants given to the Armenian Meliks of Gharabagh, in Khachen, in other places of Gharaban, like Zakarians, the Orbelians, and others. Armenian Meliks, in exchange for these lands, not only remained loyal, but sent troops occasionally during wartime for the Persian army. The last method of obtaining land was through foreclosure. I have already mentioned that, that uh, when they could not pay their money, the banks, in this case the bank being the church, foreclosed on their properties. I think we're coming at full circle now, uh, back in this country. We're foreclosing. So, another thing in the genre talks about the water rights of Echmiadzin. The dry conditions in Eastern Armenia made water the most valuable commodity, obviously, not just for farming, for, but for daily use. Therefore, water was subject to purchase, sale, rent, or seizure. Simeon devotes an entire chapter, number 18, to the various canals and man-made reservoirs that were built or purchased by the various katolikoses, as well as to the demands of Echmiadzin regarding the water rights. For example, the villages of Kultapa, Armenian, and a number of other settlements constantly went to court against the Holy See over water and pastures and claimed that Echmiadzin hindered them from using water for irrigating their fields. They wrote to the Khan of Yerevan, stating that they had lived there for 80 years and had always used the water to irrigate their fields. The Khan, however, ruled in Echmiadzin's favor. From time to time, the villagers would seize the water, and the Katohikoi would seek help from the Shah or the local Khan. This is something that for you is very strange, an Armenian church going to court against Armenian villagers, to a Muslim court. Yeah. And today, uh, something like that is very strange. Of course, today we'll go to the, our court here, but um, somehow two Christians going to a Muslim court against each other is very interesting. For example, Gadovikos Philippos wrote to Shah Abbas II that the Armenian villagers had seized the water from the Kasakh River. He received an order from the Shah by which the water from the river was finally divided into two parts, half belonging to Echmiadzin, the other half to the other 20 villages. 
Since half of the water was not enough for the villagers, 20 of them, they continued their argument with the Holy See. But the argument continued, and we have document after document after document, it was really never resolved. Another thing that's important about the book for historians is the source, this book has a source on the taxes and services collected by the church. The great majority of peasants, and they were majority of the people, were farmers and peasants, or as they were called in Persian, Ra'ayat, and in Armenian, Mashak, who lived on lands belonging to the church or various monasteries, functioned as communities that paid their taxes in kind or cash. Echmiadzin had 23 villages, owned 23 villages, which paid part of their harvest to the Holy See. In addition, the church also possessed other lands, such as pastures, hay fields, orchards, and gardens. According to Simeon, the peasants had no right to sow anything there without the permission of the church. Vagar Shabbat had one axe plow, which was purchased by Catholicos Philippos. A second plow was obtained in the early 18th century. There were only two plows and they were owned by the church. Although the noted historian, Petrushevsky, has identified some 35 different taxes collected in the region, most of them were not collected in Yerevan. Taxes fell, as I said, into two general categories, cash and kind. According to Simeon, 10% was collected on all types of grain, as well as other produce harvested annually. This 10% was collected either in cash or kind, and could vary from place to place depending on the product, water rights, and other agreements made with the church. Simeon illustrates that the church, unlike other monasteries, especially Echmiadzi, did not have to pay any taxes to the state. The Holy See and everything that belonged to it was tax exempt. The fields, vineyards, threshing floors could not be counted. Their mills and other immovable property could not be recorded. They paid no custom duties for exports or imports and no poll tax. Now we come to historiography. I'm almost, I know you're getting tired, but I'm coming almost to the end. It's very complicated. It's a 500 page book. Most of it having to do with legal issues, the records, etc. It's a very important work for people in the field, for Iranian historians, Armenian historians, social historians, and economic historians. Uh, it's not an exciting book, but it has a lot of material in it. Even prior to the first publication of Jambert in 1873 in Echmiadzin, Hovhanes Shachatunyans relied heavily on Simeon's manuscript, which was housed at the Echmiadzin library for writing this a book called The History of the Katoliko State of Echmiadzin and the Five Ararat Districts. After Jambert was published in 1873, and this is the translation from the original 1873 edition, Ormanian, the famous Ormanian, used it extensively for the biographical information on the various Katolikoi in his monumental work as Gapatum, which is upstairs in the library. In the 1920s, Professor Avdalbegian utilized Jamber as a main source for his history of land tenure in Yerevan. In 1940, two Armenian historians, Professors Bogosian and Harutunian, made extensive use of Jamber in their own respective studies. In 1940, Professor Malhasian, a noted Armenian scholar, completed a Russian translation in Moscow, but he died in 1947 and did not see it published. The Russian translation was finally published in Moscow in 1958 under the supervision of Professor Arutunyan, who also wrote a very nice introduction. A version in modern Eastern Armenian was prepared by Professor Hambar Sumyan in Yerevan six years ago through the efforts of the late Archbishop Mesrop Ashjan 
of the prelacy in New York. Armenian and Russian historians during the communist period cited a handful of examples in Jambar to prove that the Holy See of Echmiadzin resembled the feudal landowner who exploited the tolling Armenian masses, either on its own or with the help of local Muslim Khans. They portrayed Echmiadzin's ownership of villages, fields, pastures, vineyards, orchards, vegetable gardens, oil presses, mills, threshing mills, houses, canals, as examples of early capitalism of the church. Moreover, loans made by Echmiadzin to Armenian peasants and the seizure of their property when the loans could not be repaid were cited as examples of the church as a greedy banker and moneylender. Well, obviously, the communists were not happy with the church. They also pointed out that the church exploited its peasants, taxed them, and not only viewed them as serfs, but sometimes also purchased serfs. However, Simeon Jamber and his Hishat Akaran, together with the works of 17th century Armenian chroniclers, such as Arakel of Tabriz, Zakaria Gulis, Zakaria Kanaker, Katolikos Abraham of Crete, all of which have been translated here, paint a totally different picture. The Armenian church, in the absence of an Armenian state, was the only guardian and protector of the Armenian people who lived under Muslim domination. The role of the Katolikos as the Khalifa of the Armenians gave him a special stature and responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim rulers and government officials. Jambar is full of examples of the precarious conditions facing Echmiadzin in dealing with each new Muslim Khan, governor, or king. The Katovikoses had to appear repeatedly in the Sharia court or before the Khans and the kings to present the previous decrees and deeds of ownership or tax-exempt status and after spending large sums, receive new documents for the same properties. H. Miyazin should not therefore be viewed as a modern church organization, but should be seen instead as a theocratic Armenian government within a Muslim state. The right to dispatch nuncios to collect dues for Echmiadzin and the struggle of the various Katolikoses to maintain that right in Persia, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire, as well as the accumulation of property, allowed Echmiadzin to respond to the many emergencies and uncertainties which faced the church and its flock. The taxes collected in cash, kind, and the dues made it possible for Echmiadzin to build or restore hundreds of chapels, hermitages, and monasteries. There was no Armenian government. To feed over the 500 monks and priests who lived at Echmiadzin, as well as the thousands of visiting pilgrims to spend thousands of tumans in court fees and bribes, and to ransom, we have the records, ransom and purchase Armenian prisoners who were enslaved from Muslims. Portraying Echmiadzin as a large feudal landowner by citing a handful of examples without noting the numerous benevolent deeds citing, cited in the same works as well as other primary sources which paint a very different picture of Echmiadzin and its Catholicos, especially after 1629, was really short-sighted at the best and kowtowing to Soviet communism ideology at the worst. Finally, in preparing the volume, I have used, as I said, the original edition, have examined all the other available material in all the languages, and have created, added, in addition to other notes, my own copious notes. If I'm not mistaken, it's close to 3,500 footnotes in six languages. So it's really annotated for people who want to know all the details. Simeon makes use of parentheses to explain certain passages. I, in order to clarify Simeon's text, have used brackets. 
My main goal and challenge was to prepare a translation that was readable and useful without sacrificing the flavor of the original. I have therefore retained some of Simeon's repetitiveness, verbosity, and style. Because of the many foreign words, the repeated references to various kings and katoikos and the sheer size of the 530-page book, I have footnoted some names and terms more than once to help the reader. There is a large glossary at the end of the volume which should also be consulted for the meanings of the numerous Arabic, Turkish, Persian, Mongol, Polish, God knows what other words that appear here. It is hoped that this, the first English translation, which by the way we have to add without Nasser's financial support would not have seen light this fast because we got this book out in six months will make Simeon's unique work accessible to a wider scholarly and even non-scholarly. There is a lot of material. I know I have written it and there, I've translated it and I am biased, but read, once you start reading it, it, you may find it much more interesting than you thought. Thank you.